So what we saw before is that the dorsal telencephalon has expanded because it is the part of the telencephalon that develops into the cerebral cortex. The ventral telencephalon becomes subcortical uh, structures. And so here what we have um, is a, is a cross-section through the embryonic brain. Here's the diencephalon. Here's one telencephalic hemisphere. And you can see in red, I've put the, air, the dorsal part, which is going to become the cerebral cortex. And the cerebral cortex is just, as we said before, just this outer rind of the, of the cerebrum. The ventral part has two eminences. Uh, they are called ganglionic eminences, and this is why the basal ganglia, which are formed by two structures that derive from these ganglionic eminences, um, are named basal ganglia. Uh, so the, uh, the core structures that derive from the ganglionic eminences are the striatum and the globus pallidus, or pallidum. In modern terms, we now call other components, such as the subthalamus, subthalamus and the substantia nigra, we also call those part of the uh, uh, basal ganglia, but the core structures that we share with the hagfish and the uh, um, crocodile and et cetera, those are the striatum and pallidum that come from the ganglionic eminences. So what we're now going to do is we're going to think about a little bit caudal to this. And so let's go over to the whiteboard and I'll show you what I mean. What we've talked about so far is a situation where you have the hindbrain coming from the rhomencephalon, the midbrain coming from the mesencephalon, the diencephalon forming the thalamus and hypothalamus, and then the telencephalon becoming uh, the cerebral hemispheres. And if you took a section through here and you looked at it, a cross section, what you would see is that here's the diencephalon, Here's the telencephalon right, and here's the telencephalon left. And they're all floating free from each other. If all that had happened is, is this development that we've already talked about, the only join is at the frame in a Monroe. So these are free floating. Now, that's not the situation. So what's going to happen? Well, it turns out that, there, that the way that these structures get uh, connected to each other is by the development of two uh, tracks, two axonal tracks. One is this uh, corpus callosum, okay? So this is the corpus callosum. It's going to keep the two telencephalic hemispheres tied to each other. And the other one is called the internal capsule. And what it does is it comes along here the medial surface of the internal capsule is the lateral surface of the thalamus, and the uh, lateral surface of the internal capsule is the telencephalon. And it forms a physical join between these two structures. Then this part, there's, a, there's another one over here on this side. Axons coming down. And then this piece up here. This is all velum and repositum. OK, so now that I've drawn that somewhat crudely, we're going to see a nice diagram of it back on the slides. So here is looking down. And what you see is diencephalon, mesencephalon, rhomencephalon, and the overlying two hemispheres. One connection is through the corpus callosum that knits these two hemispheres together. And the other connection is by axons that are diving down here as the internal capsule. If we take a section that comes through here, we can see it in this way. Here's the diencephalon. Here's that third ventricle, that slit. Up here would be chorid plexus. And here, is, um, here are the two hemispheres. They are joined by the corpus callosum. The two hemispheres are joined to each other by the corpus callosum, and they are joined to the diencephalon by the internal capsule. What is the internal capsule? It carries the output from the cerebral cortex to the thalamus, to the brainstem, and to the spinal cord. And, the, and it does not admit any uh, information going up. 
It only takes information going down with one exception, and the one exception is information going from the thalamus to the uh, cortex. But no information comes from the brainstem or the spinal cord and travels through the internal capsule. So the internal capsule is primarily information coming from the cerebral cortex bound for either the spinal cord or the brainstem. The corpus callosum is going to join the two hemispheres, and it's going to join specifically a neuron in this part of the hemisphere with, or in this part of the cerebral cortex with its, its uh, analog on the other side, its partner on the other side. So it's not going to join this, a cell here with a cell here. It's going to join a cell here with the same place but on the opposite side. Okay, let's just take a look at what this, the, these two structures look like. We're getting a little more complicated here. Um, and what this is, is uh, these are the hemispheres. Here's the lateral ventricle. You can see the corpus callosum that is joining the two hemispheres. And you can see the uh, internal capsule. This is just beginning to be formed. We'll see it better in the next slide. So here's the corpus callosum that makes sure that these two hemispheres don't float off from each other. And here's the internal capsule, which is going to keep the telencephalon fixed to the diencephalon. So what we're going to next see is a section that is, is this way. Uh, so this is called a horizontal section, or in radiology terms, people will call this an axial section. And it is the best way to see the internal capsule. So here we have the right hemisphere. This is the back. This is the front. The right hemisphere, the left hemisphere. You can see this is the temporal lobe out here. This... Um, this piece right here, this is the third ventricle. And so the thing that's next to the third ventricle is the thalamus. This is thalamus. And so what we know is that the internal capsule joins thalamus medially with telencephalon laterally. And it's not dorsal telencephalon, it's ventral telencephalon. So here is the internal capsule. Here is thalamus. Here is, is the striatum. This is joining telencephalon to diencephalon. That's the physical join. This is another piece of corpus callosum. Okay. So, uh, so the join of the internal capsule is on sub cortical structures. Anything that's underneath the cortex, this outer rind, is subcortical. And it's, the join happens between the, the um, striatum and, and pallidum uh, on one side and then the thalamus on the other side. Okay, so we're, what we're now going to do is just look at the role of the corpus callosum and, and by looking at that we're going to look at the role of the two hemispheres. And this is work that was um, started by Roger Sperry, and he won the Nobel Prize for it. And since Roger Sperry's death and even before it, it has been um, greatly expanded upon by uh, Michael Gazzaniga. And what Sperry and Gazzaniga did was that they studied split-brain patients. And as we'll see in a, in a future lecture, um, one of the treatments for people that have intractable seizures has been to cut the corpus callosum. Why that works is an, is an interesting uh, story, and we can talk about that. But um, suffice it to say that, there were, that in the 50s and 60s, there were a population of patients who had split brains. They had a cut in the corpus callosum that was put there deliberately in order to control seizure activity. And it was, a, it was an effective um, treatment. Now, if you just watch them normally, there was no problem. They didn't act weird. They were not, you couldn't figure out, you wouldn't say, oh, that person is a split brain patient. So to discover what happens, what, what's going on in a split brain patient, what, what differences there are between that person and a, um, a healthy control, uh, you have to do some tricks. And one of the tricks is to, is to present the brain with two different images. 
This is not two different eyes. This is two different what's called visual fields, another topic that we're going to get into. If the person is looking straight ahead, everything to the right of where they're looking is going to go to the left brain, and everything to the left of where they're looking is going to go to the right brain. So let's say that we present to the left brain chickens, a picture of chickens. And to the right brain, we present a snow scene. And now we say, we, we take those pictures off, and we ask the person to, to point with their left or the right hand to what they saw. Well, with their left hand, uh, with their left hand, they're going to point to uh, a chicken. And with their right hand, they're going to point to a snow shovel. Those are the choices that they get. Okay, so the, the, the right hemisphere is seeing a snow scene. It points to a snow shovel. The uh, left hemisphere is seeing a chicken. It points to a chicken. Now, the, the issue here is that only the left hemisphere is capable of speech production. Okay? So the right hemisphere cannot say sentences. So now we say to this person, what did you see? Now, remember, these, these images are long gone. Well, the person says, well, I saw, I saw a, a chicken. Um, I saw a chicken coop. And then you say, well, why did you point to this uh, snow shovel here? Oh, that's easy. You need a snow shovel to sh shovel out the, 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 the chicken coop. Um, so what they're doing is they're making up a story. And they will make up, the left hemisphere will make up a story for what the right hemisphere just did, which was direct the left hand to point at a snow shovel. The snow shovel has, the snow shovel was pointed to because the right hemisphere saw snow. But the left hemisphere is going to make up a story that, in fact, it pointed to the shovel because the shovel is used to shovel out the used straw in a, in a chicken coop. Now, the confabulatory magic that the left hemisphere creates is not just present in split brain patients, it's present in all of us. But the one that gets to talk is always the left hemisphere. So it is going to make up a story, true or not true, that is going to cover what is going on from the right hemisphere. And what this has led us to understand is that there are, there are specializations that the two hemispheres have. So the left hemisphere is, is first of all, involved in language, and it's involved in um, more logical, mathematical skills, uh, and it is the interpreter. It sees what the person is doing and makes up a story that makes sense in that um, to cover up what the person is doing. Whether it's true or not is, is a different matter. Now, the right hemisphere also has its talents. If you take one of these split brain patients and you give them a, a, a building block, a, a, a square or a house or some kind of object made of building blocks, and you say, make, the, uh, make it, if they use their right hand, they fumble. They cannot do it. This is really worthwhile looking at, uh, at on YouTube to, to see um, videos of this. But, and if they, you ask them to do it with their left hand, they immediately do it. No problem. So the, there are spatial abilities that are present in the right hemisphere that are not present in the left hemisphere. I just want to end with one um, intriguing thought that people have been talking about of late, which is that uh, the, we know that the left hemisphere is necessary for reading. And reading is, uh, evolutionarily speaking, a relatively recent phenomenon. And one of the thoughts is that, that people that have difficulty with reading, and that difficulty is called dyslexia, that means difficulty with reading, um, are stronger, uh, ha have these right hemisphere abilities um, that uh, are, are no longer in, in modern fashion because of our, uh, our predominant dependence on literacy and reading and writing. Um, it's, it's an interesting avenue uh, that a lot of people are looking into. Is it right? I don't know. Uh, is, it, is it intriguing? Yes. And, and is there probably a kernel of truth in there? Probably. 
Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to finish up by looking at an overview of the central nervous system. Um, what does it do, and what happens when you um, injure it? <laughs>